All right, everybody. I'd like to uh, thank everybody for coming tonight, and uh, I'd like to call the town meeting of 28th of March, 2023, to order. <clears throat> All right, and uh, seat there. All right, and I think our first order will start. We'll do the uh, Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, and God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. So next we have the reading of the constable's return by our town clerk. Pursuant to within warrant, I have notified and warned the inhabitants of the town of Sunderland by posting up attested copies of the same at the town office building, the Sunderland Public Library, and the Sunderland Post Office, seven days at least before the date hereof, as within directed, Frederick A. Laurinaitis, Constable of Sunderland, April 19, 2023, at 9.53 a.m. All right, next up we have our town dedication, and this will be to Al Richards this year. I'll turn it over to Tom for that. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Mr. Richards, where are you? In the back corner. <laughs> So, so in, in our annual report, we have, as many, as many may know, Al has been serving our community for many years. He started his volunteer service in the 1960s when he was elected to the Sunderland Grammar School Committee. In 1972, Al continued serving and was elected to the planning board serving until 1977. Al also taught high school biology and was a science department head at Frontier Regional High School, but he still found time to continue serving the community in a variety of areas. He was on the Improvement Council, Conservation Commission, Recreation Commission, and while he retired from his day job, he has been a Board of Registrars member, a longtime election worker, and a constable. You will probably still see him at a town meeting or community event our strong sense of community has served Sunderland well. Mr. Richards was my 10th grade biology class. Um, I took two things from that class that stayed with me to, the, to this day. One, I never got a detention because the football coach went across to they were across the hall from one another and said, look, Tom needs all the help he can get. Please let him come to football practice, and he helped. And I know how to sex a fruit fly. Um, but Al, Al has uh, impacted not only all of us in our community, but Al was a teacher, and the word teacher has very special connotation for a gentleman like Mr. Richards. He, he helped each many individuals grow to their fullest potential, even though that person may have not known he was growing or needed the help at any that particular moment. Mr. Richards, thank you for from a 10th grade biology C student um, and also as a member of the Sunderland Select Board that truly appreciated everything that you have done in the past, today, and we'll do in the future. Al. Al, Al don't sit down yet. Nat Natalie, Natalie, could you uh, please? 
to, to the microphone, please. <laughs> Mr. Richards, it's good to be here with you tonight, and I've been honored to have your support for a very long time. And I certainly appreciate your involvement in our community, your engagement in politics, all things good in politics, and for keeping me in line. I really appreciate that. Holding me accountable, certainly. So I'm here tonight on behalf of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the House of Representatives, be it hereby known to all that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to Alan Richards in recognition of your decades of dedicated service to the town of Sunderland the entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope for future good fortune and continued success in all endeavors. Given this 28th day of April, 2023, by the House of Representatives at the State House in Boston, signed by Speaker of the House, Ronald Mariano, and State Representative Natalie Blay. Congratulations. <clears throat> All right, next up we have our Spirit of Sunderland Award for Barry Tozlowski. We would like to recognize Barry Tozlowski. If one was fortunate to know him, you were aware of his generosity, most of which were anonymous acts of kindness. He was a volunteer on the Recreation Committee, and the Economic Development Committee. He also served on the Zoning Board of Appeals for 46 years. He was committed to the residents and the community. He had a quiet presence in many aspects. If a need was brought to his attention, he just took care of the matter, wanting no recognition, and just stepped up and helped. As a business person, Barry had many friends, acquaintances, and colleagues who benefited from his expertise. To Barry's wife, Liz, we thank you for sharing him with our community. We always appreciated his humor and passion, and he will be sorely missed. I'm just going to apologize now in advance, too, because I'm getting over a cold, so unfortunately you may hear me cough a few times tonight. Um, Next up is uh, our In Memoriam section. If we had the Oscar production crew, we'd have a lovely uh, screen behind us and some music here. But um, <clears throat> uh, tonight we'd like to recognize those citizens that have passed in the past year and contributed their time and expertise to the town of Sunderland. We'd like to note Liz Foster and Donnie Strozik. Elizabeth. Elizabeth M. Foster, born 1947, died 2022. Liz served on the Town Administrator Executive, Search, sorry, Executive Secretary Search Committee, the Town's Finance Committee, the Veteran Memorial Building Committee, the Economic Development Committee, and more recently was active in the Council of Aging, which she enjoyed. And second, we have Donald Walter Strozki, Strozik, sorry. Um, Don was a member of the Sunderland Fire Department for many years. He was also a town employee as an active member of the Sunderland Highway Department as a laborer. He worked for the town from 1975 until he retired in 2006, um, born 1947 to 2022. Thank you. <clears throat> and uh, now a quick word from uh, Natalie Blay once more. Or was that, that was your, okay, all right. Good. All right. Thank you. <laughs> really quick word. All right. And now uh, we have Lauren come up for a moment. I don't know if you want to come up here or go over there. Whatever, whatever works for you. 
Can you guys hear me? Yep. Um, I wanted to take a moment tonight to acknowledge the uh, incredible contributions of Tom Fiden Kevitz on this, his last town meeting as a member of the select board. Even. Even before his 24-year stint on the select board, Tom served the town as a member of the Planning Board, Conservation Commission, and Permanent Building Committee. A back-of-the-envelope calculation suggests that the 24 years on the select board equals about 1,000 meetings. Yikes. Of course, we all know Tom did way more than that, representing us on regional school committees, regional EMS, the South County Senior Center, a real passion of his, uh, to name a few. He was determined to get affordable senior housing in town, and we did it. And, how, and has anyone been to a flu clinic or a COVID clinic or any other town or regional event where Tom was not lending a hand? Lord knows that over the years, Tom and I did not agree on everything. But one thing we would agree on is that not agreeing is a good thing. The ability to resolve disagreements and work toward common goals is what drives us to continue to participate in this small d democracy. I know how committed Tom has been and that he's always worked in the best interest of the town. So Tom, I want to acknowledge the debt of gratitude that we all owe to you and, and to Mary Ellen. And next year you can join us old timers in the back of the room. Thank you. Okay, now just for a few quick introductions, I'm uh, Dave Pierce, your new town moderator. There's, we have Wendy Clerk, uh, Wendy Clerk, <laughs> Wendy Hool, <laughs> Wendy Clerk, Wendy Hool, our town clerk. <clears throat> and uh, on this stage tonight, we have Tom Fiden Kevitz. <laughs> uh, we've got Crystal Drake Tromboy and Nathaniel Waring on our select board. We have Jeff Kravitz, our town administrator, and now up on the front. This time we have David <laughs> Jenkins, our town councilor, and we have from our finance committee tonight we've got uh, Linda Forge and Joe Elias. Right? <clears throat> and uh, this is the moment where I make a, a shameless pitch for volunteers for the finance committee and any other town positions. Uh, please contact uh, Jeff at town hall because this town runs mostly on volunteers, so we really appreciate your time, and we'd love to have anybody who would love to get involved. Democracy doesn't work if you don't participate in it. <clears throat> Cindy, do we know how many people we have for? OK. Seventy-two. Okay, thank you. All right, now just a quick note. We have the Sunderland Elementary School Committee. We have Greg Gottschalk, the chair, Megan Arkin, Jessica Corwin, Peter Gagarin, and Keith McFarland. And this will be Greg and Keith's last term on the, select, on the school committee. So we'd like to thank them for their service. And for the Frontier School Committee, we have Keith McFarlane, Christopher White, Lynn Roberts. Uh, I don't know if Lynn is in the audience tonight. I don't see her, but this will be her last year on the school committee. So we'd like to thank her for her service. And then our school administration, Darius, Darius Modesto, the school superintendent, who's somewhere back there. I saw him. There he is. Okay. We got. Ben Barshavsky, our elementary school principal. Rick Martin, the superintendent of Franklin County Tech School. Ross Covers, the business manager for Franklin County Tech. And also we have uh, Shelley Parita. I don't want to forget her. Uh, our fabulous business manager. I saw her somewhere. There she is. All right. Um, so just a few brief notes. We've got the voting cards. I don't know if you're all familiar with these. We've used these since, I think, the pandemic. So if you have a question. Hold up your question. 
because they also help us with not just the, the audible, but we can also see the votes too. Yes or no, based on your vote. And when we get to the um, budget where we put holds on items, if you want, you can either just say hold or you can um, hold up a question if you want to, and then let me know what section you want to do that to. Well, but we get to that momentarily. And then in tonight's, you should have a packet. We'll include the motions and information on certain articles. And then once we get to the budget, which will be Article 4, I believe, we'll uh, go through each category. And like we usually do, um, I'll mention the category, and you can either raise a card or mention if you want to put a hold on a particular topic, and we'll discuss that topic or your questions on it. And then we want to try to keep tonight uh, the meeting efficient and moving along, but we also want to ensure that people have time for their input and to be able to ask questions. So uh, please, if you're, and also if you're following the Bruins out there in the audience, um, no spoilers for those of us who are taping the game. So, <clears throat> And then um, any amendments to a motion will need to be uh, written down. You can write them down on a piece of paper and then bring them up to the town clerk if there are any. And uh, the, now we get to the, just before we get to our articles and everything, this is the uh, credits part of the evening. I'd like to thank everyone who participated in putting this meeting together. Wendy, Cindy, Jeff, and everybody in the town offices. John Boschen, the director of FCAT, and the staff are recording tonight's meeting. Uh, Dogwood Audio has been hired to provide the sound system. So we've got some lovely new speakers here tonight, so hopefully everybody can hear everybody. <coughs> And uh, let's see, okay. And I'm just going to explain that um, we're allowed to, I can declare a two-thirds vote, but if someone does disagree with the vote, seven people may ask for another vote, and then we can ask voters to stand or raise their card and have the tellers count that for that vote. And then uh, now we get to power, we have to swear in our tellers for the evening. So if you're one of our tellers, if you'd like to step forward. One's a surprise. One's a surprise, ah. So I think we have Carol Cushai, Will Sillen, no, no, oh no? Carol, okay. So we got Megan Arquin, Jim Bernotis, Caitlin Rock, and Will Sillen. So if you can come on up for a second, we'll swear you in. And at this point, uh, we've got a couple other things that we usually do. I'd like, to, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to have somebody make a motion to dispense with the reading of the motions to save us some time. Motion. Do we have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Declared by majority. <clears throat> and then next, uh, I'd like to ha have a motion to allow the school officials, town council, and other em town employees permission to speak if they are not registered voters of Sunderland. Motion. Uh, second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That's true. I'm sorry. Yes. Any opposed? Do you want to read that? Yeah, I can read them. I can. Re sure, that's fine. That works for everybody. All right. Just wants a pause to, so that people can read each one when we get to the article. Okay. Most of them aren't too long, but some of them are a little longer. So, yeah. Appointed pause. Hmm? Appointed pause. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so. On to our first article. Mr. Moderator, and I'd like to move Article 1. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Declare by majority. 
Mr. Moderator, I'd like to move Article 2. Seconded. We have a second. Yeah. Yep. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Opposed? All right. That one is unanimous. Mr. All right. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to move Article 3. Second. All those in favor to move Article 3? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Is there a question? Yes. <laughs> I'm already well still in South Main Street. Um, is this when we go through the uh, budget that you handed out? Uh, Park by park? You know, yep. You know, yeah. Okay. All right. Because I, I, I have a hold I want to place if we're going to go through that. So we do that before we vote? or yeah, What I'm going to do now is I'm going to read each section, each okay. category, okay. and then if, you know, to do a hold on it if you want. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. So our first category is general government. Does anybody want to put a hold on that one? General? Okay. All right. Our next one is town buildings. Does anyone want to put a hold on town buildings? No? Okay. Next one is police department. Anybody want to put a hold on police? No? Okay. Next up is fire department. Anybody want to put a hold on that? No, that's a hot one. Come on, no? Okay. All right. Inspect <laughs> inspectors and other protection. Anybody? Did somebody say? No? Okay. All right. Highway department. Anybody want to hold on that one? Okay. Next we have health and sanitation. No holds on that? All right. The library. Any holds on the library? Am I right? Okay. Yeah, we got a hold on line. Okay. Two holds so far. Uh, the elementary school, anybody want to put a hold on that? No? Okay. Uh, Franklin County Tech, anybody want to pull? You want to hold on that one? Okay. So we got a hold on Franklin County Tech. So now we have the uh, total frontier. Any, the frontier assessment. Anybody want to put a hold on that one? I don't. Yep. Okay. So we're going to hold on frontier. We have benefits and insurance for town personnel. Any, hold on that one. Okay. Yep. All right. So we have a hold on that. And I'll just recap the ones we have a hold on as soon as we're done. We're almost done with them. Uh, miscellaneous and reserve fund. Anybody want to hold on that one? Nope. Okay. And then the uh, wastewater treatment plant. Anybody want to hold on that one? Okay. We have uh, debt and interest category. Hold on that one. Okay. Okay. So that covers all our categories. So we have a hold on general government, library, Franklin County Tech Assessment, the Frontier, and the Benefits and Insurance. Oh, yep. You want to put a hold on that one? Okay. So we also have the uh, out-of-district one as well. Thank you. All right. So off to our general government. It was Will, right? Yes, thank you, uh, David. Hmm. Um, and thanks for producing the line item. Okay. I, the last time I touched the mic, I broke it. Um, 
So I thank you for doing the light item that you have, the, breaking it out on the, on the website. Appreciate it. I just wanted to know, uh, there's a line 18 is the resource administrator salary. It's a new position. And I'm wondering, is that broken out from somebody else? Is this new requirements for the town? What does the resource administrator do? Thank you. Do you want to do that one, Jeff? Or? No. Oh. Yeah. Can you hear Jeff on it? Yeah. Jeff, you Jeff. It's a new position. Um, the town office building hasn't had a new position in, I believe, at least 15 years or so. Um, and the requirements have, <coughs> from grants to um, reporting have gone up in, in incrementally um, over the, that period of time, and so it's just a significant amount of work. Currently, we have no backup for anybody in the office. If somebody is out, uh, that office closes, so part of this person's responsibility would at least be a body behind a desk to take messages, answer phones when um, people are on vacation or out sick, and, and then other sort of administrative <coughs> duties. <coughs> All right, the next item that we had to hold on was library. We have, oh, we've got it, yeah. Hi, uh, Susan Triolo, Garage Road, and I would like to know what the 13% increase is for. All right, and we've got our library director coming up right behind you there. Thank you. Hi. Um, so the 13% increase is for two different things. So our um, budget is broken into two categories. There's personnel services, which is our employees. And then expenses is our library materials budget. And it also pays for our consortium. Um, the past decade or more, um, what the town provides us is about two-thirds of what we need in order to meet state requirements for purchasing materials. This will bring us up to um, about 75% of what we need, and that takes a lot of burden off of our, our private donors and fundraisers. Uh, so we're very excited about that potential change. Um, the increases in personnel services, um, mostly is just normal, um, you know, standard of living increases, but we also are adding um, extra hours to the um, head of adult services position. Um, this is a really crucial position in our town, um, and we are formalizing the fact that this person serves as acting director during any um, unexpected leaves, um, you know, when the director cannot be present. Um, right now, there is no plan <laughs> for if anything happens, um, and this employee um, needs those hours in order to be able to fulfill the duties of the acting director on top of their normal duties as well. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right. Yes. So, Catherine and trustees, could I ask, is this a policy position that's being made for acting director or potential director, or is it a specific to an individual? Because that succession plan is, is yes. important. So it is um, for the head of adult services position. It's not tied to the individual employee. It's whoever serves as the head of adult services is the de facto acting director. Hmm. You're welcome. Thanks. All right. Any other questions for the library? All right. Our next item that we had to hold on was the Franklin County Tech Assessment. Did you have that, Susan? Again, I would just like to know what the increase is for. I'm guessing students. It, usually it is with that one because it's pretty direct. It, our, our assessment there is based on enrollment, and enrollment has gone up quite a bit since last year. So yeah. uh, we don't have control over that. That's a number provided to us from Franklin Tech, um, and it's simply just our share of the school given the number of students we have. So, so, so Susan, we, uh, our agreement with the Franklin Tech goes back to kind of like the original when they redid education reform back in the early 90s. So we basically pay for whatever changes are in the enrollment. And so if we have 
right? Frank, if we have eight students, we pay for eight. If we have nine, we pay for nine. If we have seven, we pay for seven. And their enrollment is a little different where they don't, um, it's like they accept so many from each town. It's a competitive, it's a competitive uh, enrollment. And so we really don't know how many we're going to have from one year to the other. Each town also, if you look at the assessments each town has for the tech school are as different as well. So they can run from the maybe 9000 a year up to 20 plus thousand dollars a year per student. So every student goes at a different rate. Um, ours is about 18,000 or so in that in that area. So it, it's it's it, it can make a big it, may, it can make a big difference from year to year what what happens. All right. Any other questions on that topic? All right. <clears throat> I think the next one we had to hold on was the total frontier assessment. I think Linda, did you have that one? Or? Um, <clears throat> we had quite a lot of questions that the superintendent's office did not seem to be able to answer for us. Um, we requested a copy of the superintendent's budget, and we were denied that opportunity to see it. Um, I would like to know how much money is in the school choice for frontier fund. To the first comment, all budgets were sent over to the office, so I don't know how you didn't receive them. Um, so I apologize. I'll try to make sure that. I received for a frontier. I was, I was denied the opportunity to see a superintendent's budget. The frontier budget is the superintendent's budget. No. Okay. It has the total superintendent's budget for the for your office. So how it is divided? So it would have the total of all the five schools. For your salary, your the people who are employed at the superintendent's office, all of that before it is divided into the four towns. Oh, we didn't create that, so that's why you didn't get it, I guess. I was never never got an email requesting that. I could have had Shelley put something it together. Went to your, I requested of your business manager. To whom? Business manager. Okay. Okay. So what was the, I didn't hear the question after that. Okay, I have quite a few. How much money is in the school choice fund? All right, I'm going to ask Sh Shelly Pareto yep, to, sure. to jump in with me here if she has that. So I do apologize, Linda, if you didn't receive what you were looking for. I did send Jeff all of the materials twice um, when your request those. came in. So I must have misunderstood that you were looking for something different than what we provided. So. Um, I'll take responsibility for that. Uh, school Choice Fund currently has uh, about 1.8 million in it. However, school committee did vote to use uh, 750,000 for capital projects uh, in the coming year so that we did not have to go to the towns to ask for those funds as part of our capital assessment. Uh, so after those projects done, we'll have around 1.2. Okay. How much is in special ed revolving? Uh, probably th roughly 250,000. Okay. How many students are special? Um, how many students are special? Are school choice? <clears throat> I have to go to my notes. I want to say around 135, but he can get the right number. It's about a third of our population. Okay, and each one of those receives how much? Only 5,000, right? About 5,000? Um, unless there's special education increments, we receive funding for special education okay. services dollar for dollar. So how many are regular and how many are special ed? Mm, I don't have that information. I don't have that information here. It's 184 this year. 184. 24 is special ed? No. Oh, we was, don't have that number. That was school choice. I don't have I don't the have breakdown. Number. Okay. She just said 135 are school choice. No. I, I said that's what I thought the number was. He pulled the exact. It's 184. 184. Correct. So that's a, that's a substantial 
percentage of your students. Isn't that about? It's about a third. Yeah, that's quite a lot. <coughs> you don't know how many are special ed? No. Okay. <coughs> Is there a question that ties to that that I could possibly answer? Yeah, it does, because um, if we're only receiving $5,000 per school choice student, it costs a lot more than that for each, each student. If you take your total budget and divide it by the number and you anticipate an enrollment next year, it's substantially more than 5,000. Correct. But so the way special school choice works is that you get 5,000 per student and then any sped increments on top of that. So any child that receives any services from speech one hour a week to a full one-on-one, -on -one, we get compensated back from the state. So we get actually more than 5,000 per student if those students' needs are higher. Right, but not with our regular kids. But not with our regular kids. We yeah. pay for that. So we're actually subsidizing other school districts, in essence. It, I mean, it's a debate about school choice. So I look yeah. at it this way. If you have a wedding, okay, if you have a wedding and you invite guests, you have 100 guests, and you want to invite 10 more, does it cost per this? Are you, are you adding the same amount of people, price to those extra 10 guests at that wedding? No, you're not. The first guest costs the most because you have to get the band, you got to get the decorations, you got to get all the food. The additional guests don't cost as much as the first guest. But if our enrollment is going down, we may need to make other adjustments. Correct. Like perhaps not replacing a student, who, a teacher who retires and having maybe even slightly larger classes. Correct. And the school committee is having conversations about that. The enrollment that's coming up from, sorry, I got my back, everyone, my apologies. Um, the school, the, number, the enrollments that are coming up are shrinking, and we're going to have to adjust our classes as, as that happens as well. So we are making plans in the future to be doing that. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Oh, no, I have one other question. Um, what percent raise are you receiving this year? What percent raise? Yes. Two percent. The, the contractual, the contr teacher's contract? Yeah. The teacher's contract was 2%. No, your raise. My rate, I don't know, 2 or 3%, somewhere. I'd have to go look. It's okay. pre-negotiated when his contract was negotiated at the beginning, so we probably haven't looked at the yeah. actual percentage. I can go look it up and get back to you. Thank you. Keith McFarland, Old Amherst Road, uh, Frontier Rep, for two, two points. One, uh, for addressing the school choice in the future. The school committee has um, taken a serious look starting around fourth grade that there's a significant decline. We have to be very strategic about how many students we're accepting, and that's going to have to change going forward, and we're entering in those conversations. And it, there's a significant part of that of um, family members who are in our system already. So we've, we've entered into conversations. We don't have any answers yet, but we're very aware that we have to be very strategic about our school choice going forward. The second thing is the, the number in the, the budget seems to be incorrect. The frontier total assessment, the 192.217, is actually a 9.1% increase, not a 5.9. So we feel like we need to be completely transparent about that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for that clarification. <clears throat> All right, any other questions on Frontier? Oh. Sorry, I just wanted to be transparent right. with the question. <laughs> My raise was 2.5%. Thank you. Were the teachers, okay, so the teachers, are teachers were 2%? two, yes. And instructional assistants? Teachers were two this year. They were three last year um, and, two and there are two next year, and that's what was part of the, that contract negotiation. Okay. My, I'm, in a, I'm currently in a five-year contract going into my fifth year. The number on that was correct, right? Just the percentage goes off? Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. And I know, too, if you want, you can get, we can get copies of the contracts if you need any of that information. So, <clears throat> all right. Any other questions on Frontier or clarifications? 
Okay. Next up, uh, our next hold was for out of district tuition and transportation, I believe. I'm not sure who I that. Yeah. Hi, I just have a question about who that covers. Is it just children with special needs who need something we can provide, or is it also students choicing out of our district? It's um, students going to Smith Vocational that have, uh, because Smith offers programs that aren't available um, at Franklin Tech. All right, any other questions on the out of district tuition and transportation section? Okay, I think our next poll was benefits and insurance. We do have that for time, right? Mr. Moderator, I wanted to not, not so much as a whole hold about um, the number, but I wanted to explain how the number came about. Uh, last, last year we had uh, uh, a couple members of the school committee came to the board with a, a concern about the sh percentage that the town contributes to our employees' uh, health care benefit. Uh, 24 years ago, the town was paying 50 percent, and over over the years, we generally we had we gone to 55 percent and then 60 percent, and the last maybe five or six years what we we were concentrating we were concentrating on as a town was to try to ensure that our our employees didn't get stuck paying a lot of these out of cost pockets that many of you are familiar with um, but what we did is that when we we took that um, conversation that we had earlier last year around this time last year and there, there's really a process that the state, the state requires us to follow. And part, if, if you have an opportunity to read the uh, uh, select board report, one of the things that we mention is how blessed we are in our community that whenever we have a need for committees to be filled, we always get people to stand up and, and volunteer their time and services. So we needed to put together a insurance advisory committee, um, and over the past year, we 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 got employees and we got town members that that came together, and over the last year, they looked at the insurance plans that surrounding communities offered, that the town offered, and the percentage. And after um, meetings and discussions. They made a presentation to the, the, the select board uh, probably two, two, three months ago, and at that presentation, there was a recommend, recommendation that the town increase its contribution rate to 65 percent and to maintain the insurance carrier that we have right now, which is Maya, um, and to maintain that plan. Uh, the board talked about it. Um, and and at that time we have voted. So what you see is an inc the increase is due to the fact that we are going, the town is going to contribute 65 percent to the employees' health. That will also make us more competitive and in line with other communities. So teachers, when they, teachers and staff, when they get a 2 percent or 3 percent or 5 percent increase, whatever that increase is, it's, 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 it's an more equal. So you get the same amounts coming out of the pocket and, and going into the pocket. So that's, that's why you'll notice that there is an increase on this article. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thanks. That was a good, good explanation for that. Any other questions on that item? All right. The last budgetary item we had to hold on was debt and interest. I think that was you, Scott, right? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'd like to ask if there are projections forward looking at what future debts there are. As we wind down mm -hmm. our current debt, and we're standing in, I think, the second borrowing round around this building, certainly the third time we've replaced or rebuilt the public safety complex, and then other assets in town, what are the, what are the thoughts? Thanks. 
So, so, Mr. Bergeron, we will have uh, Nathaniel represents the the uh, board on the capital committee, and Nathaniel, they they've been working on a five and ten year plan. So I, I, he'd love to talk about that. I'd love to. Thank you. Um, yes, cur currently in our current capital plan for this year, we don't have any leases or new debt. Um, going forward, um, there is about $4 million worth of capital projects just in the next 10 years. That's at today's prices, and just in the last two years, we've seen the cost of an ambulance go from 250000 to 375000 um, So that number is likely to grow and doesn't account for anything that becomes emergent in the next 10 years in terms of um, you know, something breaks and we don't know about it until two years from now. Um, we will likely be adding debt going forward when we have projects that are half a million dollars or more um, because it's harder to absorb those in a given year. Um, but this also ties into an article that we're going to be talking about soon, which is a capital stabilization override. Um, our goal here is that we're hoping that we don't hit a million dollar capital year without a plan, without money in the bank, and without a, a way of getting through that. Um, Borrowing at that point going forward is one way of, of absorbing those kind of costs, um, but that also adds interest and adds, you know, is pushing that responsibility down the road. Um, and so we're trying to balance both funding sources, debt, grants, <laughs> all the thousands of things um, in order to try to squeeze a couple of drops of blood out of a, a rock. Um, because if you look at our operating budget, the money we bring into town is so tight that. Um, Basically, capital, capital things are an afterthought, and so we're, we're trying very hard to make it be a forward-thinking plan so that we don't come into a year and have to come in here and say, we need a huge override, um, and then if that override fails, you know, no new roof for the school or, you know, cold kids or warm kids or whatever it happens to be then on that particular item. So, Mr. Moderator, if I may, mm -hmm. may also... Um, Mr. Sillen's kind of slipping. He, it, it, before Mr. Sillen, it was Mr. Crenshaw. They usually ask, what do we have in stabilization and what do we have in free cash? And, and, I, and, and I, I, I've been waiting for Mr. Sillen to, to get up that microphone and ask that. And I was wondering, Will, are you going to ask that question? <laughs> Come on down, Will. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, are you ready? Oh, Jeff's getting his numbers out. I was trying to get that information from Dana, but he doesn't know. Um, so before we start spending, spending free cash uh, and money from the stabilization fund and the budget, can you give us a figure on how much we have right now? Uh, I, I'm glad someone asked that question, Will. <laughs> so the current balance of free cash is 767833000 dollars 833. Stabilization is 368,511. Um, capital stabilization is 1,296. Uh, Title V is negative 91, and I think it has been for a while. Um, CPA funds is 1,173,662. Um, wastewater treatment plant and sewer reserve, 1,100,631. Uh, 1, Mr. Moderator, um, thank you, uh, uh, Jeff. So when we look at those numbers for town our size, we have a guideline from the state about how much we should have on hand, right? So how are we doing according to those guidelines before and after we spend the money? Hmm. Yeah. So um, the recommended cash reserves are 3 to 5 percent of the operating budget. Um, and total cash reserves at the end would be about 700,000 which is about 8% so it's above the 5% and free cash is more than that so we have more than that on hand right now so so part of the part of the budget and and we and again we wanted to talk about it we have we have to make we we make make commitment through OPEB to our and we actually have a policy that was established by the Finance Committee and Board in the Select Board of five, ten years ago. So this year we're, we're actually looking at trying to put $50,000 in the OPEB, 
which is a little bit more than normal. Uh, so what we're recommending is using $222,000 from free cash uh, for the budget, but $50,000 of that is, is what we would call a non-reoccurring, um, and that's going to be in, going into the OPED. So we're looking at about $172,000 out of free cash, which is, is, is in line with our, with our guidance from our free cash use. Yeah, Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And we'll kind of cover those as we get to the other articles. We see us moving money based on that programmatic move into the, into the according accounts. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions on the budget? I think that was our last hold. All right. Are we ready to vote on this one? All right. All those in favor of Article 3, the budget? You didn't say all in favor, say aye. I, I, sorry. All in favor, say aye, please. Or hold up your lovely green cards. Yes. <laughs> all right. Opposed? All right. It's uh, unanimous. All righty. On to Article 4. Mr. Mar Moderator, I'd like to move Article 4, please. I second. All right. I'll just pause briefly. They can read that one. You're all set. That one's a little longer than some of the other ones. So. All right. All those in favor of Article Four. Say aye, aye. Or hold up your lovely green cards. Aye. 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 All right. Well, all those opposed to Article 4? All right. So we have one no, so uh, declare by a majority. <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, I move Article 5. Seconded. All right. And I think um, the CPC, uh, I think they wanted to do a PowerPoint, correct? And I see Jeff out there. Setting up the AV for that, so. <clears throat> Where does the power so we're going to have a little presentation, I think, before. Uh, well, are you going to this screen back here, Jeff? Or? Oh, you just got, okay. If you can't see it, feel free to step up and get a little closer if you need to. Lauren, you're going to do a presentation for it? All right, thank you. get to the vote after the presentation or if, if there's any questions or anything. Do you want to do the lights? This is starting to look promising. All right. Can people see that? I think we're going to need a jumbotron in the next school budget. Huh? Yeah, I need a jumbotron. <laughs> We ready to go? Okay, so I'm, I'm Lauren Starr. I'm the library representative to the Capital um, Planning Committee. And we, uh, and this article is about our um, Capital Stabilization Fund, which is um, how we try to fund most of our capital projects. So we, as a town collectively, uh, own and buy a lot of stuff and buildings and once we have them we got to take care of them and when we need new things we got to replace them so here's a montage okay so next slide yeah how do we plan for capital expenses so we have a we we plan carefully um, we have a, a committee that meets quite regularly um, and we uh, assess the requests that come in from the different departments we uh, prioritize, we think about how they can be funded, and just so that we're clear, a capital asset is um, something that has a lifespan of three or more years and a value of $5,000 or more. Um, so, okay, next one, yeah. So how do we evaluate the needs? Well, in, in addition to, 
you know, reading the request and, and um, talking with people and the uh, department heads, et cetera. On 2018, we commissioned a study of all the town buildings to kind of give us a look forward at what um, upcoming expenses might be in the future. Excellent. Okay. So um, how do we pay for them? So I like to, the analogy is sort of the checking account versus the savings account. So prior to 2014, we kind of, you know, town meeting rolled around and we were like, do we have extra money? Can we put an article in? How are we going to pay for this stuff? Um, in 2014, we established the Capital Stabilization Fund. And the idea at that time was, uh, you know, this is no way to run things, that what we really need is a steady stream of money that would provide a reasonable uh, starting place so that when we look at the capital request, we have a reasonable, uh, uh, we can reasonably hope to fund um, most of the needs that we have. And we started that fund with about $125,000 a year, which we knew even in 2014 was inadequate, but it was a way to start the sort of planning process. Um, the other point I'd make about having this kind of process, not only it's like having a savings account. You put the money away, you have a better starting place when the needs come up. It also, just in terms of how the town runs, it, it kind of gets you away from pitting departments against each other. If you, are if you can adequately or reasonably not either fund something or say to a department, look, I can't do it this year, but we know it's a priority, we'll address it next year, then you are running a much tighter operation. Um, in addition, uh, capital stabilization um, every year gets a percentage of free cash transferred to capital stabilization. So I think when um, Jeff just went over the balances. Right now, capital stabilization is down to $1,200. That's not good. Um, the 125, or it's actually like 124 something, but 125 will go in there automatically because of the vote we took in 2014. And you'll see an article later today that will transfer 200,000 in free cash. That said, next slide. When you look at the budget, and this actual budget you have in your handout, you just don't have the colors. Um, so if you look at this budget, the green cost, so this list is, we asked the departments to project their 10-year needs. And is this 100% accurate? No, of course not, because you couldn't tell me what you're going to spend money on at your house for the next 10 years accurately. But you have an idea and you, you know, make preparations in that uh, along, those, along the way. So this is the 10-year list. Um, with $125,000 on hand, what we can fund is the things in the green columns. So that is, uh, that adds up to 125, and that is uh, mostly an ambulance, which we don't have a whole lot of control say over because we buy that um, regionally. Um, and I can't read that from over here. Wait a second. I did memorize that. Um, it's a truck lease uh, for the highway department. And it is um, 97.50 for exterior room vans here at the school. The blue column is everything that we determined really should be funded this year, um, but can't fund. And that basically shorts every department in town. Um, and that short is $273,000. And the Third column is really everything that would be left over the next 10 years, which adds up to $4 million. So going through this exercise, it seemed pretty clear to us that um, a reasonable amount of money that the town should be setting aside every year is $400,000, not $125,000. And that is why we are looking at a override of $275,000 um, for capital stabilization. I did want to point out that on that um, chart, there's one line highlighted in purple. That's the HVAC upgrade at the um, uh, public safety building. Um, and I'll come back to that later. We intend to fund that out of that, to, that transfer from uh, free cash. Um, I think people feel quite um, serious that that's a serious uh, health related need, but we don't have a uh, firm estimate on it, so we could not, we couldn't, we couldn't put it in, A, there wouldn't have been enough money in the green column, and B, we didn't really um, 
have enough information. So that is something that we intend to plan, um, fund in the coming year when we have more information. Okay, next slide. All right, Ooh. what about other funding sources? Um, so as I said, you know, 400,000 a year is also, honestly, probably not always gonna be enough. Will we, consi will we be looking for other funding? Absolutely, we're always looking for grants. Um, we're always looking for a share if some departments have other sources of funds that we can put together. Sometimes it's borrowing, if, as, as Nathaniel was saying before, if the, if the item is, if it's too much, then, then there's possible borrowing. And I also wanna um, point out that because of the ARPA funds that we received, which was money related to the pandemic, um, we were able to clear some backlog. So this list would have looked even worse if we did not have the benefit of the ARPA funds. Okay, what will it cost me? Um, so the $275,000 override is 53 cents on the thousand or 175.71 on the average house. And if you're wondering how our tax rate looks, um, our tax rate has gone down. So we are now almost at a historic low. We're at a, a rate we haven't seen in almost 10 years. And mostly, if you look in that column on the right, is because we have paid off a lot of our debts. The, um, the overrides that we have had um, that were related to specific projects that were was debt borrowing, those were paid off. So we've paid off, you know, we've paid off the library. We've paid off the public safety building. Um, we've paid off um, on a lot of big things. So honestly, our tax rate is down nearly $2, um, $1.90 since last year. Um, and I think uh, our conclusion, and having really spent a lot of time on it, is that if you really realistically want to be able to maintain, you can go to the last slide, Jeff, to maintain the assets that we owe, if you don't want to have a lot of deferred maintenance, um, you got you to gotta fund realistically what things are costing. And uh, you know, everyone knows prices have gone up. We, we, our buildings are, the new library is almost 20 years old. I mean, thing, you know, I'm very, sa I'm very sorry to say the new library is almost 20 years old. Um, we have to take care of what we have and we feel this is a reasonable number so we hope you will support it. Thank you. Thanks for that presentation. Just give Jeff a chance to get back up there. All right, any other questions on Article 5? All right, all those in favor of Article 5, hold up your card. Yes, question, come on down. Yes, Dana. So just a point of order, how does this work, Mr. Monterey? Can you just explain the process if we vote yes for this? Um, we're not done, is that correct? There's still another step? Yes, then it would be voted on at the town election, right? So this is just essentially to pass this, and then we have the full vote before the town, so. Mr. Monterey? Yes. Um, the, uh, Article 4 is not a continuing capital budget. This is what we're paying for with the existing no, capital we're stabilization. We're on five. five. Yeah. I'm sorry. Is that what we're on for? That's Excuse okay. We, that's all right. Yes. We're, we're already on five. On the yes. Sorry. Yep. Right. Did that answer your question, Dana? This is part A. So part B will be Saturday when you all show up and vote. So. Yes. A has passed in the form of Article 4 that capital budget is moving forward with existing funds that are available. Article 5, as is being presented, is contingent on an override. If Article yes. 5 does not have funding, this spending does not happen. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Yeah. That yep. is correct, Scott. Thank you. Just wanted to be clear. If I can just so, for a second. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the, the debt coming off of our books is part of why we're doing this is that 
rather than borrowing this much money and then it goes off the books in a couple of years, then we have to go back to the town and ask for this much money again, and then it goes off the books in a couple of years, and then we go back to the town and ask for this much money again, and it keeps doing that. We're asking for one time, can we just set a reasonable number so that every year we don't have to try to figure out where we're going to find the money? Um, and also, honestly, a lot of the times it feels like, you know, important buildings in town, important services in town are sort of held hostage to a vote that could mean that we don't get a new roof on something or that kind of thing. Um, and we have a lot of recurring expenses that we know we're going to see. If you look on this budget, every two years we buy a new cruiser for about $80,000. So there's $40,000 every single year that we're seeing um, that we don't have a plan for. And the whole idea behind the capital, the capital planning committee is to look forward rather than looking backwards and to, to have a plan so that um, that the, the people who do a very good job working for our town know that their building is going to be taken care of in the coming years and not having to year to year hope that something's going to pass. If I could, Mr. Moderator, mm -hmm. I want to thank the select board member for that, that, for that endorsement for the override itself. But my line of questioning was specific to this year's budget. Okay. So if, if the things in Article 5 right, don't we pass do. in the form of an override, <clears throat> that expenditure does not happen. That's correct. Thank yes. you. Yep. Thanks. Yes. Right. We still have to pass it mechanically, right? Yeah. Right. So what Scott's saying, if you remember my columns that were in color, but if I, on your sheet it's the second column, FY24, with override. If, if, the, if the override fails at the ballot, these things will not be funded that, this year. And again, that affects every single department, highway, uh, library, uh, you know, police, fire. Uh, school. Everyone is is not getting so, uh, things that they, you know, not only requested, but we're very high on our list for funding for this year. Right. Take some of those wild oscillations out of the budget going forwards. The the noise, as you you always said, yeah, and it helps you plan better, and you you don't have to scramble. <clears throat> so so when. When we uh, first did the hundred thousand dollars for the capital, it it was uh, understanding came from from the board and the finance committee that there there was going to be a continual drain, a continual drain on the monies that were coming into town, and that hundred thousand dollars that we set aside has has served us well. But every for instance. Um, fire chief will tell you that if you look back when we bought a fire truck that presently it's our second oldest truck but I think it may be number one the, the it, it was like two hundred or three hundred thousand dollars <laughs> when we just bought our less than ten years later we were up to five hundred and six thousand dollars for that fire truck and I I was just talking I believe someone over in Deerfield was telling me that they're looking at just a few couple years later they're looking at over um, seven eight hundred thousand dollars for for a fire truck our amp the, the South County EMS ambulance just two years ago was two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and now we're being told it's three hundred and fifty thousand dollars if you order today so capital capital costs are going up, and if we want to try to maintain our buildings, what what this is understanding is that 70 percent of our budget goes to education. If we want to continue to fund education, which which is a necessary thing, we also have additional costs, and we have to put a new roof on the school eventually. We have to maintain the school. This this helps take that pressure off from the education every year because we are dedicating money to our capital expenses that we need, we know we have to have to put forward. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. If I can just, one more thing. Yeah. One of our big concerns yeah. is if we end up having a year where there's something we cannot defer that's well over the money we have, a $700,000 expense that, like, you know, electricity shorts out in the school and we need to put a whole new electrical system in or something like that, 
we don't have an option of doing that. And if we don't have money for that and we can't come up with money for that, then we're looking at going to all the town departments and saying you need to make drastic cuts so we can cover this capital expense. Um, and that's one of the main things we're trying to avoid is having to go to these departments and say you need to have layoffs because we basically did not plan well for this. We didn't have a contingency plan. We didn't have money set aside. Um, and so it's, it's important to us to have that written in here. Jeff, yeah. Yeah. So just, you know, Joel lies here on the Finance Committee. I'm just, you know, looking at it is I'd rather have money in the bank that prevents us from having to borrow money in the future and pay an interest rate. I'd rather have money in the bank ahead of time so that doesn't have to happen. Meanwhile, that money in the bank is earning interest for us. Good point. All right. Any other questions on Article 5 before we get to a vote? All right. Seeing none. All those in favor of Article 5? Aye. Aye. All right. All those opposed? That looks unanimous. All right. I don't know where we were on that. Next up is Article 6. I move that we move uh, Article 6. Second. All right. All those in favor of Article 6? All right. All those opposed? All right. Article 6, unanimous. Mr. Moderator, Article 7. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to move by Article 7, please. Do you have a second? Second. All those in favor of Article 7? And we have a question first. Yes. Not to be that guy, but <laughs> you just spend right. like one minute talking about what mm -hmm. 6 and 7 are, that it's a policy that we're moving money to places that it needs to go. I, that was, I have my note right here because, as we talked about earlier, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, go ahead. Yeah. So the, the town has a free cash policy that we've established before, um, and that policy is up to 30% of free cash going to the operating budget. General stabilization, um, once the D Department of Revenue recommended 5% cash reserve threshold, um, up to 10% of free cash annually. This is considered a rainy day fund for emergencies and extraordinary expenditures. Um, the general idea is that once, free, once the new year starts, we can't touch free cash until next year. If we put money in a general stabilization fund, something big happens in town that needs money, we can call a special town meeting in September, vote on that, move the money out of the general stabilization fund, and be able to fund whatever it is we need to do. Free cash is tied up. If we leave it in free cash, we have to wait until next year this time before we can touch it. Um, and so this is just a way of being able to squirrel away that free cash in a place that doesn't lock it in place for a year and gives the town the ability to have that be more liquid in terms of moving forward. Um, and then for capital, st capital stabilization, it is recommended that we have 30 percent, um, and the 200,000 that we're moving in is just shy of that 30 percent, but um, that's what we went with. And free cash generation, um, in general, we like to leave about $100,000 in free cash for the following year. Um, the idea there being that if uh, our receipts come in lower than we thought, we don't want to end up with a negative free cash number at the end of the year, because that's a problem. That means we just we don't have money there. Um, so the idea here is that that gives us a little bit of wiggle room so that come next year, um, if we had a little bit of a dip, we don't end up being negative there. Um, and then other is 5%. Uh, and this year, the, the money went into those four buckets, the operating budget, capital stabilization, general stabilization, and leaving money in free cash. Well, this sort of ties that red thread back to Will's questions about those balances, too, so you can see how it all kind of fits together. All right, any other questions on Article 7? All right, sorry, I'll ask you to do it. Can you hold up your cards, or all those in favor? All right, thank you. All those opposed? All right, unanimous on Article 7. All right, and this is Article 8, and this one is, as we often have, a uh, bill from a prior year, fiscal year. Mr. Moderator, I motion we move Article 8. Seconded. All right, all those in favor of Article 8? All right. Any, uh, all those opposed? 
All right, Article 8, unanimous. Mr. Moderator, our movie, I motion we move Article 9. Second. All right, any, uh, you want to just give a brief explanation on this one, because I think this one might be new to some sure. folks. So there was um, a series of <coughs> lawsuits of, um, involving pharmaceutical companies and the opioid epidemic. Um, some of the money from those lawsuits comes to towns in order to help provide health services that are related to opioid settlements. Um, what we're doing is we're establishing a stabilization fund to put that money into, so it's a bucket to put it in, so we know where it, where it is and how much it is, and we can keep track of it more readily. Um, and the amount we're putting it in is going to be covered in a, in a future article. Exactly. This is just establishing of that yeah. fund. Thank you. All so, right. So, Mr. Moderator, so so everyone knows, they're, they're allowed to, you're allowed to put the settlement monies in a lot of different funds. Um, what we're trying to do is trying to keep it in a, a fund that everyone will know how that money is being spent and if there's ideas or there's needs in the town, like maybe funding a community nurse, um, that we, we would know that there's monies available to do so and we can track that where that money is going as well, which is for we think is an important thing. Yeah. All right. Any questions on that before we move on to the vote? All right. All those in favor of Article 9? All right. Thank you. All those opposed? All right. Article 9, unanimous. And then Article 10 now is the actually funding of it, like uh, Nathaniel was mentioning. Mr. Mar Moderator, mm -hmm. I'd like to move Article 10, please. Second. All right. All those in favor of Article 10? Oh, we got a question first. Yes. Sorry. Uh, no, just in point of no conf apologies. confusion. No, it's okay. Um, so the town has already received. <clears throat> And placed into free cash the seventeen thousand. Yeah. Yes, this is money that we've already received, um, and we we have it in free cash because we don't have anywhere else to put it currently. And this is just moving that money from that settlement into the fund itself. So we anticipate we anticipate Stuart seeing another sixty sixty one thousand dollars over the next few years. Right. Okay. Thank you. Yes. So. I understand the opioid crisis and the cash settlements that have come from the various pharmaceuticals, but I don't understand why we're getting money or if it's just like all towns are getting something. Yeah, it's, it's part of the settlement is money going directly to all the towns in Massachusetts um, based on population and other factors. Um, the idea being is that um, the settlement's not just about people who are directly affected about that, it's also a drain on our ambulance services, it's a drain on our police services, it's a drain on a lot of services in town, and this is a, an acknowledgement that um, the town has already paid money out because of their malfeasance, and this is our way of getting some of that back to help, you know, and, and also to not just retroactively, but also going forward, it allows us to be able to, as Tom was saying, maybe get a, a community nurse, um, or do other programs, outreach things that allow us to try to help combat the ongoing epidemic of, of opioids because it's not like it ended because of the settlement. Um, this is also forward thinking there too as well. Yes. Aaron Falbo, 422 Amherst Road. You partly just answered the question, but I'm just wondering what restrictions are placed on the monies Money. that are in this uh, stabilization fund? Someone else might be able to answer this better, but uh, it has to be related to um, opioid health. And my understanding is it's a little bit vague about exactly what that means. Um, we would most likely have to defend that. If someone were to question why were you spending this money on a new fire truck or something like that, we'd have to have a good reason for why that was the case. Um, but our understanding is, is that as long as it's tangentially related to the opioid epidemic, that the money can be spent there. Anyone else have any better answer to that? Yep. One of the things we had considered is um, 
a community outreach program about the dangers of opioid epidemic, um, as well as um, making sure people are aware of resources available, not just to people who are suffering themselves, but also family members of those people and that kind of thing, um, as well as potentially a, a more real-world application like the nurse or um, possibly combining money with other regional towns for a regional nurse, that kind of thing. There's a lot of things around the table there. And we do absolutely encourage and, and look for public comment and suggestion on that of how best to spend that money. That's all of our money. Um, and so I do, you know, if you have any suggestions, please do feel free to reach out to Jeff uh, and he will bring those to us. All right. Any other questions on Article 10? <clears throat> all right. All those in favor of Article 10? All those opposed? Unanimous. Article 10. All right. Mr. Article Moderator, 11. I motion we move Article 11. Seconded. All those in favor of Article or actually, I should, uh, any questions first? No? Here. Yeah. Yep. Um, Frontier has requested that they are allowed to uh, open an, a capital stabilization fund for their own capital needs. Um, as they mentioned earlier, they spent some, some school choice money for that, but the idea being that they want to have a fund um, that they can move um, E&D money, which is their version of free cash, into um, so that it, like our capital stabilization fund, they're thinking in, in the future. Um, I don't remember the exact number, but there's a couple million dollars worth of stuff coming up in the next bunch of years also for Frontier, and this is partially their way of trying to avoid having to come to us to ask for money for those projects, um, which, Darius, thank you very much. We do appreciate that. And, and also, the, uh, with the creation of this, this uh, stabilization fund, school committee would have to vote two-thirds or two -thirds to uh, take the money out of the stabilization fund as well. We've got a question. If I could ask, how is that uh, capital budget developed and how is the assessment formula or how is it assessed to towns? Come on down, Darius. Also, as part of the last capital plan at Frontier, there was a note that was to be uh, completed projects from years prior, and I haven't seen that in our town meeting packet. So this is right now, we're not, we're, we don't have a mechanism to fund. We're, we're not looking to assess the towns at this time to fund the um, stabilization account. We would be transferring money in from either school choice or E&D, which is frontier is free cash for the region. Um, the idea is that one of the bigger projects we have coming down the, down the line is the roof. And it's going to be right now with the escalating crisis, it's going to be five to seven million. Um, but that might be five to ten years out, and if we can start putting some money away instead of just keeping it. Right now, we keep those kind of funds in school choice, and then if we had other needs, and all of a sudden we'd be, we would, you know, we're being able to categorize, and people can be more, more transparency. You know, from our perspective, it's you know, administrative perspective, just keep it all in one account. It's easy, but you know, the school committee wants us to have to go to you know, portion that off. You can do a stabilization account to assess the towns to put into the stabilization account. That, has not been that action has not been taken by a school committee or discussed yet. I just had one other point. The assessment, if it did come through this, the form of the assessment, wouldn't be separate from the budget. By law, we're allowed to add a line item in the budget to fund the stabilization fund. So it would become part of our annual budget that then Sunderland would pay its portion of that line item. So it wouldn't be a separate assessment like we have currently for um, our ban for the track project and those other things that you were saying you didn't have an update on yet. Um, that, that in itself is a separate assessment, but this would be part of our general budget if the town is assessed. But right now, as Darius said, the school committee is trying to fund it with other forms of free cash. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. All right, any other questions on Article 11? All right. <clears throat> All those in favor of Article 11? All right. All those opposed? All right. Declare by majority. 
All right. Article two. Now the next, I'll just say the next block of articles are related to CPC. We've got three separate projects, and then we'll have the article that is our standard housekeeping article at the end where we set aside money for that. So next one is article number 12. Mr. Moderator, I motion we move article 12. Second. All right. Any questions on article 12? Or explanations? All right. All those in favor of Article 12? All right, thank you. All those opposed? All right, Article 12 by a majority. <clears throat> All right, Article 13. Mr. Moderator, I'd like to move Article 13, please. We have a second. second. Any questions on Article 13? Yes. Sean, can you come explain how much space this is going to take up? My concern is parking for sporting events as it is right now with baseball games and soccer games. There are a lot of parking spaces of the library are used and if we lose some of the grass area for parking, it's going to have a greater impact on the library. And um, I, I don't know, I think it's kind of... Wondering okay. how it all gonna, how yeah. it's going to yeah. work. Yeah, yeah. And okay. who, who put the request in? Too? Okay. Anybody want to? Do you want to? Anybody want to comment on that at all, or help? Uh... Yeah. I, I know one of you wanted to. I wasn't sure which. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Megan Arquin, chair of the CPC, um, and. Um, as I understand it, right now the current plan is to have it be near to where the volleyball courts are. Um, but Jeff, I didn't know if you wanted to speak on behalf of, of any of the planning that you have put into. Yeah, it would be approximately the same size. It would be two pickleball courts side by side, um, fenced in with a bench for each of the courts so that people waiting could have a place to sit. Um, wouldn't be significantly larger than than uh, volleyball Football. courts okay. that are there. <clears throat> so, Mr. Moderator, mm. if, if I may, we we have heard in in our in our office we have heard a concern <coughs> that there, of the potential noise the the noise issue. Um, I I don't I don't know if the location would be would would be a concern to the neighbors, but what I would recommend is that if the town meeting chooses to fund this, that we would work with the neighbors, and if we would need to, we would look at reciting it on, on the, in the Riverside Park area. I, I, I personally think that the, the, the addition of the pickleball courts the library did a great thing last year when they when they came up and they talked about the kiosk and the kayaks. And if if we want to continue our downtown, the I guess one of the, the great things is I was walking the Riverside Park walk a few a few months ago, and there was a young couple, and they were walking, and and I stopped to talk to them and and. I said, hey, it's great to be out here. They said, you know, we absolutely love this, but it's, we just bought a house, but we're kind of depressed that we have to move away from Sunderland. Now, to me, that was probably the greatest thing I, I could ever hear. And I said, well, why? And they said, well, Sunderland has a, vibra you know, vibe, a vibe about it. You know, it, it, you know there, there's young people, they've got this great area to walk. And, and the, the Riverside Park Committee, the the downtown committee, and we have a group of, of a lot of different groups, but they've really struggled to to try to define our center, and and we will continue to try to define the center over the next millennium, probably. <laughs> um, but if if we want to bring people into into our town, be, instead of becoming a pass through, we want people to stop. We have to we have to start doing things like this, like the library with the. Uh, the uh, uh, kiosk, maybe the library, if the pickleball courts go in, maybe the library would start renting out paddles and balls to the, uh, 
to people also. And, and maybe right now the, the location is maybe not the perfect location, but I would, I would hope that we would, we would talk to our neighbors if there is a concern and see if we could, you know, if we could have another location as well. So thank you, Mr. Moderator. Yes. So just uh, to the finance committee vote sitting there, 022, I just wanted to let you know where it came from. We, we were kind of like a lot of you were unaware where it came from. We trust the CPC to do their homework and, and uh, research where it could go. And, and just we were concerned. And <coughs> two of the votes were no. Two of them were abstaining because of you know, la lack of knowledge. And uh, I appreciate Tom Lee just said it's not set in stone, and that's where it's going to be. You know, I agree. More recreational for the town people is, is a good thing. Sounds like there's a new T-shirt in there, Sunderland. We get vibe, we you get know. Vibe. All right. <clears throat> Any other questions on uh, Article 13? All right. Uh, all those in favor of Article 13? Some pickleball fans out there, huh? <laughs> All right. All right. I like that enthusiasm. All right. All those opposed? All right. Declare by a majority. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Article 14. Mr. Moderator, I motion we move Article 14. Second. All right. Any questions? I see a couple of questions. All right. Nancy, we'll start with you. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Nancy Pick. I live on North Main Street, and um, I certainly want to acknowledge the historic and architectural importance of the church in town, but for me this does raise questions of the separation of church and state, and I have some questions related to that. Mm -hmm. um, back in 2018, there was a similar um, situation in Acton. There were two CPA grants to restore stained glass windows and the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court ultimately barred the dispersion, disbursement of the stained glass grant in part because it would allow the church to spend its money on its religious mission instead of shouldering the burden of building maintenance. So um, while I would love to see the steeple repainted and maintained, I don't have a clear sense that, that doing that would be then enabling church missions that not everybody in town would feel included in. It's not a civic organization. It is a church. And um, I do wonder whether we would be considering spending $60,000 of town money if this building were being used as a synagogue or a mosque. So um, uh, I also wonder, like, how desperate is this situation? You know, are there no church grants available? Are, you know, are there loans available? Are there other sources that are not town monies? for getting this important repair done. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody want to, anybody have a comment on that at all? Or, or do we? Oh, no. I'll, I'll yep. just start. And then, yeah, um, and then we'll get to. My, my personal thinking on the matter is just that the, the steeple of the church <clears throat> is such an iconic part of the town. Most of the pictures of town, most of the, you know, if you look at, it, it, it's what the, the skyline of, of Sunderland is, and the town has benefited from that part of character of town for the length of the church has been here. Um, and I felt that while I share your concerns about the separation between church and state, that this was our town's way of helping to maintain the skyline, you know, the, the views in town and the beauty of our town um, in a way that I felt comfortable with at least. Go ahead. Alana Schmidt on Reservation Road. Um, I kind of shared the concern that this was a kind of honing in on, on church and state separation, but I will say that in Amherst specifically to think would we be spending, would be having this conversation if it were a synagogue rather than a church or a mosque, um, Amherst had the same issue. Uh, the current location of the Jewish community of Amherst was the old Dickinson Church, and it does have some historic stained glass windows that actually reference the Dickinson family. Um, and when their belfry needed repairs, they did get CPA money and, and town money to do the repair, which surprised me, but I was happy about it. And, um, and it was felt for the same reason, that it was just an important part of the historical, histor uh, historical landmark for the town. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. We'll start with you, Dana, and then we'll work over to you, Peter. And... Oh. 
Dana Roscoe from South Main Street. So I definitely support this. My concern is the uh, cost seems way too low. Um, what is the <laughs> contingency if, if this isn't enough money to pay for uh, such a complicated project? Mm -hmm. Good question. My understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that this money is our contribution to the effort, not the entire amount of money going to be spent on it, and that the church will be footing part of the bill for the project as well. Okay. Hi, I'm Carol Kushai. Hey. I've been in that church since I was born in this town, and that is a very small church. It is historical. And it's more than just the steeple painting. They're going to help with the copper roof, which we need put on. There's also still knobby tubing in the roof, which could cause a fire. So if you want to preserve your history, uh, we need to take that out and insulate it. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, Peter Lacey, um, I'm not sure I'm really adding too much here, but I am a member of the Unitarian Universalist Society of Amherst, which did get CPA funding for renovation of a stained glass window. And I would just also say that, um, you know, religious institutions generally, uh, these kinds of things are just kind of devastating um, if, if, if there is no support. I know at the USA in, in Amherst, we had to basically get rid of a very beautiful and artistic piece of stained glass that we just could not maintain. So I, I think there is to, there is a real possibility that this kind of thing could be just an unbearable burden for uh, uh, an organization like our, our church in town here, and, and um, we have to consider what that means to us in terms of the, the you know, what, what, what this thing is in town um, as, a, as a piece of our history and a piece of our landscape. So... I, I, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't really know, although I just, I'm just adding to what someone said about the uh, Jewish Community Center in Amherst. I'm not sure it's a legal issue. I just think it's an issue of what we want to preserve. Yeah, thank you. I think we have, did we have one more question? Yeah, or? Yeah. Nope, all set. Mr. Mr. Moderator? Yeah. Yeah, I'll get to it. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Moderator, uh, back to Nancy's uh, <clears throat> concerns that she stated in the beginning. Um, those were concerns that were expressed in the, the CPC uh, committee uh, meetings. There's also concerns uh, that were expressed in the, in the board when we had our discussions and, and probably also with the uh, finance committee. Um, and and one, of, one of the items you'll notice in the, in the motion is that there's a uh, uh, the church the, the members of the congregation have agreed to a a preservation restriction to be a uh, historical preservation restriction to be held by the town so that that will be held by the town and that was one of one of the ways that through our conversation with different organizations that we belong to and through town council that was what they recommend would help help make this go and and be something that the town could could support Yeah. Yep, Joe Elias with Finance Committee. And just, we, we wrestled with the same ideas, and, and I'm really proud of this citizens here bringing up these questions uh, and concerns. And, and one of our members said, when I go up Mount Sugarloaf and look back over Sunderland, that's what I see. And that reminds me of Sunderland. And, and me as a kid in the 70s driving over the bridge, that's the first thing I see. I think uh, without that steeple there, it would not mark Sunderland. So. Now, we, we agree and hear what you're saying, but we felt that that's, it, it's an iconic uh, mark for our, our community. Yes, Scott. If I could make a comment as well. Um, we did, as, as, as you know, we did kind of wrestle over this issue, but something, um, because it was not a town-owned building, but if you are aware of what happened in order for Sunderland to become a town, to be incorporated a town, one of the requirements was that you have a church. I think you had to have a doctor and a few other things, but 
that's the reason that that church is 300 years old and we are 300 years old, over 300 years old. So we recognize the historic significance. My daughter went to kindergarten in the basement. Probably some of you may have gone there or, or your kids did. So we kind of wrestled and, and um, you know, it, it's up to you guys, I guess, how you feel. If I yes. could, Mr. Moderator. Yes. I'd also add one of the other things, the requirement for incorporation was a cemetery, which is just yes. down the road. Yeah. There you go. I would, I, would, I would also ask, is the preservation restriction setting the town up for the purchase of the building in the future? We haven't discussed that, Mr. Scott. Mm -hmm. We may have right of first refusal. And I, now don't forget, I've always told my friends in Whiteley and Deerfield the best part to living in those towns is the view they have, and that's Sunderland. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yep, and then Aaron. Yep. Craig Felton from South Main Street in Sunderland. The basic issue here is we're talking about a building that is historic. If you want to use the word iconic, it is a symbol of Sunderland. There is no mention at all in this motion that there is any religious connection. We are not funding or supporting any program of the church any aspect of the religious nature of the church. So I think if we're talking about separation of church and state, that we should look at exactly what we're talking about, and we're talking about an historic building and preserving it for our community, for now and for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron? <clears throat> We've used the words iconic and historic to describe the building. Is the building actually uh, designated as an historic building in the registry of buildings in Massachusetts? Well, that's a good question. Yes. Is it on the historic register? Or? Well, yeah, is it? It is? It is on the National Register, yes. Thank you. So <clears throat> that seems to me we have an obligation to keep that building in good condition. All right. Any other questions or comments on... Article 14. All right. All those in favor of Article 14. All those opposed? All right. Declare by a majority. All right. Article 15. Now this is the annual sort of housekeeping and operational article for the CPC. Yeah. All right. Mr. Moderator, I move. I motion we move Article 15. Seconded. All those in favor of Article 15. M Mr. Moderator, I'd, yes. like to, I'd like to, to in the future, rename this article the Jennifer Uncles article. Because <laughs> she's the only one that understands this <clears throat> damn thing. She, she, gets, she spends hours with account, the accountant, and the accountant <clears throat> just lies out on the floor when she gets done with Jen Jennifer. So. <laughs> oh, you got to hand it to Wendy in writing, but we can do that. The uncle article, we'll call the, it from now on. The, the uncle article. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All those in favor of the uncle article, as it is also known as. <laughs> All right. All those opposed? All right. Unanimous on Article 15. Article 16. Mr. Moderator, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to move Article 16. Do you have a second? I second. All right. Any questions on Article 15, 16? All right. All those in favor of Article 16. All right. All those opposed? All right. Article 16, unanimous. Mr. Moderator, I motion we move Article 17. Right. Seconded. Uh, and do we have a, just uh, this one might want to warrant a little uh, explanation. 
Th this is the only article I know where we have to petition the legislators to state someone's age so that they can continue in a job that they're exceptionally good at. So um, the, the state state says any any firefighter that gets over the age of uh, 65 can only be reappointed by special act of legislation. And uh, I guess Scott's looks like he's 40, but he's going to be 65. So we'd have to do this for Scott. Yep, got to get special dispensation from the legislature to work past that age. So, <clears throat> and we appreciate everybody who does that. It's a great service. All right. Uh, any other questions on the article? All right. All those in favor of Article 17. All right. All those opposed. Article 17 by a majority. And now Article. Articles 18 through 23, we usually vote, as I recall, as a block. These are essentially the consent articles that basically let us do our jobs and operate and function as a town. Does anybody have any questions on that? <laughs> anybody have any questions on that? Mr. Moderator, I move, we, our motion we move articles 16, or 18 through 23. Okay. Second? Mr. Moderator, second. All right, all those in favor of Articles 18 through 23, the consent articles. All right, all those opposed? All right, Articles 18 through 23 by majority, uh, uh, unanimous. All right. Um, Yes. All right. So um, we've done, we've finished our articles. We just have to have our town clerk read the election warrant, and then I'll um, entertain a motion to adjourn. I can do that one. That's my favorite. That's for another night. Were you eating dinner tonight? <laughs> Were you eating dinner tonight? You are hereby directed to warn the inhabitants of said Sunderland qualified to vote in the town elections to bring in and cast their votes for the following offices to be feel, filled for the year 2023 on Saturday the 6th of May at the Sunderland Public Library, 20 School Street in Sunderland from 8 a.m. to 1 p.m. for the offices of Moderator, Select Board, Assessor, Board of Health, Riverside Cemetery Trustee, Planning Board for one for five year, Planning Board one for one year, Library Trustees, Ele Elementary School Committee, and Frontier Regional School Committee. There is a question, shall the Town of Sunderland be allowed to assess an additional $275,000 in real estate and personal property taxes for the purpose of funding the Town's Municipal Capital Stabilization Fund for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2023? Pursuant to within warrant, I have notified and warned the inhabitants of the town of Sunderland by posting up attested copies of the same at the town office building, the Sunderland Public Library, and the Sunderland Post Office seven days at least before the date hereof, as within directed, Frederick A. Laurinaitis, April 19, 2023, at 9.53 a.m. All right, and as a point of order, actually, we have to do two votes. We have to do one to uh, adjourn and then one to dissolve. So, nope. Do it oh, we can do it together? Oh, okay. All right, so I'll make a, an attain, entertain a motion to adjourn and dissolve after until May after May 6th, after the May 6th election. I motion. All those in favor? Actually, do we have a motion? I motion we adjourn and dissolve. Do we have a second? Second. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. All those opposed? Wow, nobody, huh? All right, thank you.